My name is John Coleman. I'm the author of the new guy, HBR Guide to Crafting Your Purpose. And my best advice is to focus on inquiry, not advocacy. Ooh, inquiry, not advocacy. So what's the difference, John? What, what is inquiry? What is advocacy? Because that's that sounds pretty, uh, pretty good stuff, but I don't think everybody knows what that means. <laughs> yeah. So I encountered the concept when I was in graduate school, and it was funny. I was actually dating my now wife at the time, and it was a breakthrough for our relationship that was also helpful in the context of business. And the idea in this case that we studied was that there are two modes of engaging in a conversation with another person, right? One is advocacy, where I'm listening just long enough to you to then be able to get my point in and to advocate for my position, right? It happens to all of us. I still do it, even though I know not to do it. And uh, I do it in my relationships. I do it at work sometimes, et cetera. And the point of the case was to shift from advocacy, right, to listening just to get your point across, to inquiry, which is genuinely seeking to understand the other person, uh, to hear what's behind what they're saying, uh, to, to get a good grasp on it, and to listen with the hope of, of crossing the chasm between you rather than just advocating for your preconceived um, position. And so I thought that was a, a huge framework for me and my personal relationships, as well as in uh, doing business, negotiating with people, trying to understand where people are. Awesome. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. Uh, you know, appreciative inquiry is the basis for most coaching. So that totally makes sense. I, I wasn't exactly sure where you're going there. But when I hear that, right, inquiry, okay, right, I'm curious, if you will. And then advocacy, no, this is what I believe. I'm not going to learn anything from you because I already know I'm right. Is that kind of kind of it? Yeah, that's exactly right. And we all know this when we see it in others, right? We get frustrated when we're talking to someone and trying to explain where we're coming from. And we can sense that they're just listening enough to come back, right, to advocate for their position. And so if it's frustrating to us, it's got to be frustrating to others. And I think if we all learn to engage a little bit more that way, to really listen to the others that we're speaking to and understand where they're coming from, uh, that we'd reach a, reach a good conclusion and compromise a lot more quickly. Yeah, looking to understand is super, super valuable. And one of the things that you mentioned in the book here that uh, we're, we're, I'm going to skip ahead here and I promise I'll come back to purpose. But you talk, one of the points in the book is invest in positive relationships. So yeah. let's talk about that before we come back to purpose. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, most people don't realize that one of the, if not the most important key to flourishing and to living a meaningful and, and joyful life is the depth and breadth of your positive relationships. A couple of places that I've encountered this, one was the Harvard Grant study, if you've ever heard of that. And that's the longest standing longitudinal study in the world. I believe it started back in the, uh, the 30s, if memory serves. And they followed a group of more than 200 men for the entire length of their life to today, right? More than 70 or 80 years. And uh, when the key researcher on that study was recently asked, uh, he's, he's not the guy who started the study, who's passed away, but the guy who's been shepherding it for the last 30 years or so, you know, this is the longest study in history. What are your key conclusions about what makes a good life? He said, happiness is love, full stop that all of the study data uh, behind what they had done and all of the subsequent research in other areas by people like Martin Seligman, uh, who founded the School of Positive Psychology, for example, is that the depth and breadth of your positive relationships is the key determinant to your satisfaction with life. And so it's something that I really focus on in the book a lot. I, I don't think you can talk about purpose and meaning without talking about creating positive relationships in your life. And I think we all intuitively know that, but unfortunately, today it's something that so many people lack, right? Uh, even before COVID, many people felt isolated. They had virtual relationships, but not as many in real, real life relationships, or they were caught in negative relationships. And, and one of the things I encourage people to do is really dedicate time and attention to expanding the pool of positive relationships that they have and expanding the depth of the relationships that they're already engaged in. Mm. So how though, John, how do we how do we actually do that? I mean, can you give me some practical tips here for how we can expand those? Because I, I hear that all the time, right? Oh, yeah, you want better. You want, you know, the five people that are surround you in five years. That's where you're going to be. And I get that. Right. But can, give me some practical stuff here. How can yeah. we actually do that? 
Absolutely. So I think in the deep relationships that you already have, it's about making those relationships healthier and deeper, right? So you may have a spouse, you may have a parent, you may have kids, et cetera. I think um, one thing that COVID's taught us is that quantity and quality time matter. You know, I used to be one of those guys who said quality time is what matters. And I think in staying home for a year uh, and not traveling as much, I realized, in fact, that, qual uh, that quantity time mattered as well. And so one of the things I push people to do is not take those relationships that you have for granted. I think particularly for those of us who are really involved professionally, it's easy to deprioritize your relationships, to think they're always going to be there. And I think that you have to day to day invest in the most important relationships in your life and that you can leverage frameworks like inquiry versus advocacy to make sure that you're deepening those relationships and making your relationship with them positive for that other person. In terms of expanding the breadth of your relationships, so how do we get involved in more relationships? One of the things that I really push people to do is think through the different environments that they're already in uh, to try and identify relationships that they could make deeper, right? One of those for most people is work. Uh, but very rarely do we approach our work relationships conscientiously, thinking this can be a deep and meaningful relationship in my life. Often we kind of segregate those things and say, this is my work life. This is my personal life where I form deep relationships. Instead, what you find in most constructive, engaged workplaces, people do have depth and meaningful relationships at work as well. Now, sometimes, you know, there are lines of appropriateness and all those sorts of things that are different than your personal life, obviously. But, you know, each of us should really have five or 10 people in our work lives that we're investing in. And so that sometimes takes the form of a mentee mentor relationship, either you mentoring others or someone mentoring you. Sometimes it takes the form of just a friend that you have at work who you can touch base with informally during the day uh, in a virtual environment like many of us are living in with now that takes more conscious effort. It may mean texting those folks, doing short calls with them, just turning your attention to making sure there are five or 10 relationships in your work life that are good. And then outside of work, I push people to be joiners, right? So much of what we do right now is isolated and many of the kind of social institutions that existed 50 years ago are in decline. So fewer people are, there was a great book called Bowling Alone 30 years ago or so that documented this, but instead of joining bowling leagues, we go by ourselves. Instead of joining a softball team, we go to the batting cages by ourselves, right? Instead of getting out and joining a social club or a church, you know, we do things from home virtually. And while virtual has introduced many positive things, what we've lost is the ability to participate with loose ties and a multitude of acquaintances in these really important community organizations. And so if you're not doing that, one of my pushes for various reasons is to get out and join some things, whether social clubs or athletic events. If you're a reader, join a book club, right? If you like Netflix, have people over for a movie night. Try and turn what used to be isolated events into social experiences. Mm. That's so interesting. So Shasta Nelson wrote a book about that, about the business of friendship. You know, Keith Ferrazzi wrote about Never Eat Alone. Yeah. Really makes a lot of sense there as, as we think about that. And as that relates to purpose, it's interesting that you talk about intentionality and relationship, but equally important, right, is that intentionality of purpose, right? You don't just find, you know, your calling doesn't just, your purpose doesn't just hit you in the head like a bolt of lightning, right? We have to intentionally create it. So so talk to me about why that's true, right? If finding our purpose, right, is not it, how do we actually get that purpose, right? How do we, how do, we do that? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges to people finding purpose today and living without anxiety about their purpose is what I think of as the Hollywood version of purpose, right? The hero's journey. It's where we see Neo in the Matrix or Ray uh, Skywalker on Tatooine. And they're living a dull, mundane life that seems directionless or meaningless. And something comes out of the blue uh, and hits them. Uh, they find it. They stumble into it. That gives their whole life meaning. And I think for many people, they're so focused on finding a purpose to give their life meaning that they develop a real anxiety about what that one thing that should give their life meaning is. And I think even that phrase, how do I find my purpose, contains three fundamental misconceptions that take people further away from purpose every day. The first of those is uh, that you find your purpose. I think you don't find your purpose, you build it. There's purpose around us each and every day. There's purpose in each of our lives every day. What we have to learn to do is really mine our lives for those sources of purpose and learn to craft greater purpose in our lives. 
The second misconception people have is that purpose is a single thing, right? How do I find my purpose? Singular. We're looking for one thing to transform our lives. And I think that's a damaging framework because it prevents us from seeing the many sources of meaning in our life. And it makes us so contingent upon happiness in that one thing that if it were to fall apart or if we were to never find it, we can feel that our lives are meaningless. Instead, I think each of us is surrounded by literally dozens or hundreds of potential sources of purpose every day. And it's learning to see the purpose in those things and to craft it into something more meaningful that gives our life a really well-rounded and holistic sense of purpose. The third misconception from my point of view is that purpose is, uh, is stable over time. So how do I find my purpose? Uh, there's an apocryphal Mark Twain quote that I don't think he actually said uh, that says the two greatest days in your life are the day you're born and the day that you find out why. And that's romantic. It sounds inspiring. But I also think it's anxiety producing, right? Because it indicates that our life is only there for one thing and that that thing is going to transform the rest of our life. Instead, I think we each go through phases in life where our purpose shifts over time. Our purpose sources of purpose are different in high school, in college, when we're new professionals, when we get married, when we have kids, when we retire, and a thousand places in between. And it's learning to see those transitions and to embrace them that eliminates some of our anxiety and allows us to see the multitude of purpose in our lives at each, each stage in life. Wow. So we don't have to find our purpose at 14 and live that for our entire <laughs> life, right? I said I wanted to be an astronaut, John. And what the heck, man? I'm not one, so I'm a failure. I mean, Life is, is, is that kind of, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, but truly, though, right? I, I can tell you, I went in the Navy out of high school. I thought that was my calling. It was not. Yeah. I thought I was going to be a school teacher. Did not. Was a stockbroker. Did not. Right now, I'm a, I, I would say now I'm a dad and a husband, and it's very different now. But if I'd focused on what I said when I was 14, I would be pretty freaking miserable because it's nothing like 14, right? 48 is not like 14. So why do we do that to ourselves, John? What, why, like, what's the payoff to that way? And then how can we start that shift into actually owning the fact that we can make our own purpose? Yeah, I think we fall into this misconception, honestly, because particularly here in the West, I can't speak to every culture, we do have this hero's journey version of purpose, right? That's common in literature and it makes for really good books and really good movies, right? Where there's this singular transformative event, right? And, uh, but it makes for a really bad life, <laughs> right? And so it's appealing to us and it's a cultural kind of myth, I think, but it actually creates a lot of anxiety because then we become fixated on this idea that we're born for one single thing. And that if we never find that thing, it's a waste of life. And if we find that thing and it falls apart, we get fired, we lose our job, we fail to achieve, uh, then, then we've lost meaning as well. You see this in athletes, for example, who are extraordinarily good at basketball, rise to the pinnacle of their profession, but never win a championship. Or they win a championship and realize there's nowhere else to go, that they have to retire, that they're, they don't get the fulfillment they want, and that that thing is unsatisfying, right? And so I think there's this kind of broad cultural misconception about it, Phil. And my push to people, um, you know, I had a woman ask me this in the very first, the, the second book I wrote about 10 years ago, and I didn't answer her well. She stood up and had, asked, how can I find my purpose? And if I could go back to that person 10 years ago, uh, just like I'd say to you, I'd say, you are already surrounded by purpose. And by overlooking that, you are, are really doing yourself and those sources of meaning a disservice. Like Phil, I mean, just looking at your life, the little that I know about it, right? You said you're a husband and father. Uh, that introduces just a multitude of meaning in your life and deep, meaningful relationships, a job that only you can fill uh, that, that has more meaning than almost anything in the world. You've got this wonderful podcast, right, where you're encouraging guests like me. You're doing a service to me by encouraging me about my work and inquiring about it. You're also doing a service to your listeners who are learning from you, who are engaging with you in community. And I presume, you know, you have a, a multitude of other activities outside of those two things uh, that are incredibly rich, right? And I think, you know, one of the things I do when I speak to groups is the very first thing I do before I talk is ask people to describe someone in their life they think is flourishing, right? Someone they think is leading a great life. And when you ask people that, even if they have anxiety about their purpose, they start to describe someone who's really well-rounded, right? 
they say my aunt really has a lot of purpose, right? She grew up helping people. She served in the church. She has great children. She always invested in my life. You know, she was always at the, the county uh, chili cook-off or whatever. They describe this person with like a really well-rounded life who was fully in touch with the multitude of purposes in their life. But for some reason, there's this chasm where they can't realize, like, I've got those things too. I've just got to learn to really lean into them and to craft them, uh, to be to be more present, more visible, and like you to embrace changes as those things shift over time. Wow, wow, that's that's interesting because I, I will tell you, I, I have a gratitude practice every day where I where on yeah. Facebook I post my three things that I'm grateful for. Sometimes they're really small, sometimes they're really big. You know, sometimes they're people, sometimes they're things. You know, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, sometimes it's the dogs, right? T today it was that I woke up at 4 a.m. and I went back to sleep and got an extra hour and a half of sleep. <laughs> I mean, little stuff, right? But to that point. I've gotten feedback that, wow, that's like really encouraging. And I'll tell you, John, between us, man, I'm like, really? Like I post that for me because I want to look back because some days suck. Like yeah. some days are like horrible, man. And I want yeah. I want that there for me. So it's interesting that you say that, that well-roundedness, because if I flip that over and I think about someone that I'm like, boy, what a boring life. All they do is insert their one calling. And I'm like, I don't want that life. Like that's horrible. So, yeah. so for me, like that's encouraging to hear, dude, like there's purpose all around instead of yeah. singular focus of, of purpose. So how, John, how did you find that though? I mean, how, cause you know, one of the things you talk about is a study that says, you know, we're the least happy we've been in years. And yet you're saying that, you know, we, we probably are maybe well, run, more well runner now. So how do you come upon that and how do we overcome kind of, I get maybe that happiness gap, if you will. Yeah. You know, I think I, I think the reasons we're unhappy and disengaged and angry right now as a society, and you see this not just in the United States, frankly, around the world. If you look at global surveys, uh, only 15 percent of employees say they're very engaged at work. It's actually slightly higher in the U.S., but still under 30 percent. Right. And so it's a it's a tiny minority of the world that feels engaged at work. I read a survey of sources of purpose recently where work, which is where you spend 40% of your time, ranked below uh, pets, reading and listening to music as a source of purpose. I mean, really, really not anything against pets or music, but if the place you spend 40% of your time is just kind of absent meaning for you, that's a really discouraging thing. I think there are a variety of reasons, honestly, Phil, that that's true uh, and that create this, this chasm of meaning for us. I do think it's misconceptions about purpose. I think that social media is actually a, a component of that because we see the highlights of other people's lives, but we don't see their lowlights and we experience our lives fully. And so it's easy to look at Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and be discouraged about our lives versus those or, or LinkedIn where we see promotions from our friends, but we never see, no one ever posts about their layoff or about you know, the thing that went wrong at work that day, they just post a new job or new board membership. And so we're constantly inundated with the highlights of other people's lives and the lowlights of our own lives. Um, you know, so, and there is increasing social isolation. I think that's only been exacerbated by COVID where we've just been cut off from many of our meaningful activities and meaningful relationships. And so I think it really is a multifaceted problem and it's resulting in a number of really critical issues in the United States and abroad. And I think the correction to that is to begin to pra uh, to approach the practice of making meaning in our lives much more consciously. I think if we approach the idea of creating more purposeful lives and meaningful lives with the same intense dedication we approach our, our hobbies, playing golf or playing tennis, or the same way we approach at work, you know, a strategic plan, or a project plan. You know, we're very thoughtful about those. We have our Excel models with different to dos. We track things consistently. We have our goals every month. We get reviews from others. You know, we have teammates that we problem solve with. And yet, if you ask me, John, like, how are you thinking about the sources of purpose in your life? Typically, most of us don't have that kind of to do list. We don't have mentors who are engaging us in that topic. We don't have peers who are engaging us in that topic. And so, one of my pushes to people is just to take this idea of living a flourishing and meaningful life as seriously as you take your work projects or other activities and to engage friends and mentors and peers in helping you to problem solve your way to greater purpose in your life. 
Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Right, just taking it more seriously and getting the right people around you to help support you is not, you know, that that's not uh, complicated. That's pretty simple, right? It's something we can do, um, you know, and and yet we don't. And I, I th that's just sad, sad to me. And I hope that, you know, when folks listen to this and, and really, um, you know, really work on this, that they take it to heart and they, they spend some, some time on that. Um, and great personal examples. Let's talk a little bit more about work because I think it's important, yeah. right? Uh, it's great that, you know, it's parents, right? A golfer, whatever, you know, that's awesome. But let's shift that to work. And one of the yeah. interesting things that you, you mentioned is that crafting a culture of purpose is not just for leaders, which it was surprising. Like when I read the title, not when I read the chapter, but when I read the title, I'm like, really, John? Like, I don't know, man. I mean, isn't it the leader's job, right? Cast the vision, the the vision and the people will follow us. So talk yeah. to me about that. Yeah. So I think there's room in the professional environment. I think there's a spectrum of, of purpose and meaning in any workplace, right? Um, that starts with the really individualistic, which is I get great meaning from coaching people. I get great meaning from writing and communicating the different things that you get meaning from at work, right? Which we could talk about more in job crafting and how you engage in that to a middle tier where you you're crafting meaning for a group you're in. Like each team will have a mission before it. Each team has a culture uh, that it's trying to uh, enhance and each team has a set of values. And then at the very top, there's corporate culture, right? It's the purpose and mission that you're all on together that helps to make sure that even in the midst of all our individual sources of meaning and purpose, that we have one thing that we're pointing towards together so that we have a shared mission we're working towards uh, and a set of values that we all agree to abide by so that it's the kind of culture and workplace that we wanna invest in. I think that individuals in a workplace have the opportunity to participate at every level of that. So if I start at the top, obviously everybody thinks of corporate purpose as more a CEO thing, right? Especially in founder-led companies. I think uh, to some extent there's truth to that, right? The CEO has to be open uh, to crafting a culture of purpose, to living with a why. The leadership team has to be aligned in pursuing that. Um, but I think that individuals at any level of the organization can really participate in, in first pushing the leadership team to think about it in that way and to really invest in this idea of purpose, right? Um, I take from my last, I work in a very small organization now, but I previously worked at an organization of about uh, 9,000 people. And before that, it was in an organization of 15 or 20,000 people. And in both contexts, I saw normal people like me reach out to the most senior levels of the company and really push them to begin to think more consciously about our corporate purpose. Uh, at the consulting firm I used to work at, for example, um, they were actually very receptive to this and solicited it. But they went out consciously and asked people across the firm, what do you think of our values? How should we be leaning into our purpose? It's not unlike what Whole Foods did when it engaged their entire workplace a few years ago in crafting their own set of corporate purpose and values. And I think individuals have an opportunity to raise their hand and really lean into that and speak into that process, even at the highest levels. And I'll tell you, you know, it doesn't always work. You got to be prepared that people are not receptive to that. But I've seen in multiple instances, relatively junior employees, um, take on much more meaningful roles in the company simply because they were conscious of the need for purpose. They were leaning into it and they really wanted to be a part of crafting that. And leadership teams were receptive to that, right? They're looking for energetic, hungry people who are passionate about those topics to lean in. And I think even if that doesn't work, you have a team, you have a group, you have a division where you can be responsible for being a meaningful part of shaping the culture and purpose and values of that particular group. You know, I, I, uh, I recall at our last, in my last team at the big organization, we thought the corporate purpose was just a little too big for us. And so we drafted a mission as a team, just the 60 of us, and a set of values for our team. They weren't misaligned with the corporate purpose, right? They were fully aligned with them, but they were our own thing focused on the things that we were doing every day. And each member of that team, all 60 people really were able to pour into that. We had an open document that people could edit they could offer suggestions. We'd meet on it periodically. And I felt like that gave us a lot more agency and ownership of the day-to-day -day work that we were doing um, aligned with this broader purpose we were all on. Wow. 
Wow, that's great. That's a super example. And I, 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 I would like to talk more about job crafting because I think that's important as we talk about the, the last point there. And Tamara says, you know, that she agrees, right? You can lead from anywhere. It's absolutely not about the title. And, and John gave some great examples there, um, how that can be. So, so let's talk a little bit about job crafting as, as we're yeah. getting close to wrapping up here. Because I, I really think out of all the stuff in the book, this is one of the strongest things that people can take but obviously building relationships that's that that's probably that helps all of your life but work life job crafting is probably it so can you define that for us and explain how we get started with that please john sure it's an awesome concept in the manager management literature today and it's effectively taking the job you have and making it the job you want right taking the job that you're already in and finding ways in which to tweak it to adapt it to adapt the way you think about it and the way you execute it to make that existing job more meaningful. There's a wonderful example from the management literature uh, where a researcher followed around janitors in a hospital, right? Um, that's not naturally a job you would think of as purposeful, right? We might think of uh, oncologists as a purposeful job, but you don't naturally say a janitor in a hospital is the most meaningful thing that I could do. And certainly there was a real divergence as they followed these people in how engaged they felt in their work. But among the most engaged people, they found that they actively engaged in job crafting and ways of transitioning what they did from janitor to a real service to patients and to a real craft that they were practicing. The examples of that were one janitor, for example, would rearrange artwork in the hospital rooms of their long-term patients so that uh, a patient who was there a long time had new and beautiful scenery constantly, that they could be exposed to something new and beautiful despite their long stay. Another janitor experimented with different cleaning solutions uh, to try and find the ones that were most sensitive to the patients uh, that they were serving, right? They really practiced craft. They took seriously the idea that they weren't there to just clean hospital rooms. They were there to serve patients and they were a critical part of patient care. And that's an example of, of job crafting where you're taking a job that in the wrong hands could be pretty mundane. It could feel meaningless, but in the right hands becomes a critical part of serving patients. Um, one other example I'll mention briefly that I use in the introduction to the book is again in Curtis Jenkins. And you can Google, you definitely should Google Curtis Jenkins, uh, who's a bus driver in Dallas. And uh, there's a beautiful video of what he's doing. And um, again, you don't think a bus driver is the most meaningful profession. And indeed, if the whole job is taking people from point A to point B, then it's not the most meaningful profession. But what Curtis has done is really create a community on his bus and take ownership for the thriving of the students that he encounters every day. Uh, when you watch the interviews with Curtis, he says he's the first person a kid sees on their way to school and the last person they see before they get home. And that's a really important role to him because he wants to make sure that kids are encouraged at the beginning and end of every day and he can be an encouragement to every kid. He assigns them each titles, whether it's secretary or president on the bus, so that they each feel they have a unique purpose in that community. And he really, um, he listens to the kids. Uh, he has t-shirts made for them sometimes that highlight, there was one, a little girl who was interested in art and she gave him a piece of art. He put that piece of art on a t-shirt and gave it back to her to encourage her to practice art. And um, the testimony of these kids, just about the difference that Curtis was making in their lives, you know, he wasn't just a bus driver, he was a mentor to these kids and he was an encouragement to them. And how, like, how could you even get a more meaningful job than being that for 50 or 60 kids at a time? And so that's job crafting, where you really approach your job with a new mindset and find ways in which to craft it more towards service and towards activities that you can find meaningful and joyful. Wow, that's so wonderful. I, I love that part of the book. I read about Curtis and I was like, Wow, that I mean, that's that's amazing. But that's ownership, right? That's the yeah. key there is you, you have to own this yourself. And I think, you know, as we kind of wrap up here, I mean, building your purpose takes work. Like this isn't accidental, right? It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't hit you like Isaac Newton inventing gravity here. This is something you can do, which I would argue gives great hope to the idea of purpose as opposed to being a seminal event that offers no hope. So very cool, John. I, I love that, man. So how do we how do we get started, right? If there was one thing right now, folks listening, folks watching, they're like, okay, 
I want to get started now. Now, obviously, you get a copy of the HBR Guide to Crafting Your Purpose by John Coleman. That's important. Definitely get that because that'll give you some great frameworks. John's got frameworks throughout the book, graphics and words that will really help you. But how can they get started along this journey, please? Yeah, thanks so much, Phil. That's a great place to start. And one of my pushes is never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's easy to get paralyzed by this overwhelming task of creating greater meaning. And the, the key to getting started is getting started. Take the first step and publicly commit to it. And so what I'll often tell people who are at the beginning of this journey, you know, there are a lot of reflective exercises that I think you go through. And it is continuous improvement. So you'll engage in these the rest of your life. But I think one of the best ways to get started initially is to, uh, to surround yourself with three or four or five other people uh, that you're going to engage in thinking about this with you. Um, that can look like a mentorship group. It can look like a personal board of directors. It can look like a peer group. It could be that all five of you are meaningfully engaging each other in these exercises. But once you reach out to these folks and say, listen, I've decided that I want to craft greater meaning in my life. And I want to start to take the first steps to do that. And you tell these five people uh, that that's what you're doing. And you ask them, for their help in that process. You're now publicly committed and you've got a group of people who are gonna hold you accountable for making progress. And I think that's a great way to start, honestly, because you're not overthinking it. You don't have to have everything right. You don't have to have read my full book or anybody's full book yet. You can dive into stuff over time, but you got a group of, a peop of people to hold you accountable to making progress, to taking it seriously and who are invested in your success. And that kind of public commitment, I think, is often the first step to making meaningful progress. Awesome. Yeah, and that also kind of wraps up all the stuff that you said about finding people, defining the purpose, you know, being a joiner, all of that great stuff. And if you're doing this at work, right, it offers some job crafting because you might find people that are in cross-functional teams that you had no interaction with before that could help you yeah. maybe move towards a place that's more meaningful for you. Is that right, John? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and again, once you kind of engage in this, you'll find that it's a virtuous cycle, right? You'll start to see other areas of your life where you can take this seriously. I mean, it really is something you unlock. I mean, you know, I write about what I need to learn about, Phil. And that's a that's a quiet secret of those of us who write. It's often many of us write about the things we struggle with or we're curious about because that writing process is the most intensive way to investigate a topic. And I've often struggled with this concept of meaning. I felt like my work is meaningless or purposeful. I actually shifted jobs in the midst of writing the book because of some convictions I got from the book, if you want a personal te testimony. And I think that um, as I wrote it and as I've researched the topic, it has been an extraordinary encouragement to me because I've just learned to see these potential sources of purpose in various areas. It's almost like the great movie, uh, you've probably seen it, It's a Wonderful Life, which is such oh, yeah. a, a wonderful old film. And, you know, one of the things he learns throughout that film is he starts thinking, my life is meaningless. I haven't made an impact on anyone. And uh, throughout the film, he discovers he actually means a lot to a lot of different people, right? There's a lot of meaning in his life. He's just become so fixated on a problem that he can't see it. And in seeing it, he's able to really lean into those things and make them and, and make them stronger, right? And I'd say, for me, that's the most encouraging thing about writing this is I've just become more aware of all the things that that are so great about what I have. I love your process of gratitude on Facebook. I actually, I use an app called Day One where I keep it. Yeah, gratitude. I like Day One. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. And I print it every year at the end of the year because days are hard. I have a regular journal and a gratitude journal. The regular journal is where I'm free to say like, this day was really hard and this was hard and this person's sick and this person I don't like very much right now. You know. You got to capture some of that stuff too. But the gratitude journal forces me to say it's not all hard, right? It's not all hard. There's a lot of stuff that is extraordinarily good in my life and that I see in the world and to force me to think about those things positively. And once you learn to see it, you can't unsee it. You just start to see it everywhere. And, uh, and I think that's one of the most transformative parts of the practice that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, jumpstart your uh, gratitude, folks, your purpose finding by doing the work. John reminds us that never let the perfect get in the way of the good. And all you need is three or five people that you can go with. And I'll tell you, if you get asked, say yes. Listen to John. 
be a joiner. You can do this, right? Yeah. So so if you want more from John, he's got a great newsletter and articles up on Substack. It's onpurpose.substack.com. Great stuff. John, I really appreciate you sharing your insights. Very hopeful for me as someone who certainly is nowhere near the purpose I was when I was 12 or 14 thinking I was going to be an astronaut. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. Pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. Awesome. It's great.